This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about the sixth episode in season one of Disney Plus's Willow series. The episode is called The Prisoners of Skellen. I have two returning guests to Coffee with Kenobi. First, let's bring in Mr. Gregory Cass. Greg, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Happy New Year, Dan. Uh, it's wonderful to be here again. Yes, well, thank you. It, it's Happy New Year to you. It's great to have you. I should probably call both of you doctors. I mean, that talk about <laughs> rude, academically rude. Come on. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that actually sounds weird to me. <laughs> okay, well, I will, uh, I will just silently bow in respect. Uh, our <laughs> other guest, you recognize her voice. Uh, she's been um, a very frequent guest recently to Coffee with Kenobi. Uh, Jen Subchakchai. Jen, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, this will be a nice check-in because I was here for the the, the beginning of the season, um, and and to see kind of like how my thoughts of it have progressed. So I'm yes. really happy to be here for this specific episode. Yes, I oh I am too. This this is an interesting one. It's definitely. I let me check the time. Uh, I think it's the longest one. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, the first one's 55. Yeah, this is in fact the longest episode. Uh, by one minute, Prisoners of Skellen, the Heroes Mount, a rescue mission into the dread mines of Skellen at the end of the fifth episode, Wildwood. The heroes were whisked away, almost literally, by the trolls, which I'm sure we will talk a lot about. But let's go ahead and um, we'll save our letter grade for the beginning. We're going to spend the entire episode kind of developing our uh, and filling out our rubrics, hmm. our, our undisclosed rubrics <laughs> for this review uh greg let's start with you what would be the one word you would use to describe this episode and overall thoughts on it hmm uh let me take those in reverse order so uh i i will just say uh that i'm not somebody who has a a deep attachment to willow um i i actually never saw the movie as a young person i saw it uh about a month ago when i uh unfortunately had a brief stint of covid um so i i came late to this um so uh i have very much enjoyed uh parts of the show so far and this episode was no exception to that so my one word um will be let's say twisty twisty i like twisty it's very good <laughs> like Jen, what about you the mine yeah um my one word would be adventure, uh, because to me, this uh, episode sort of clicked into another gear in terms of how invested I was in the the adventure, the place they were in, the quest. There's a lot of, in, you know, you can see the influence of Indiana Jones in this episode very heavily. We've had references in other episodes and homages to certain things from Indy, but I feel like this was like, you know, when they're going to the tomb it's it's very much like oh we're in an Indiana Jones movie now which I loved. Yeah, we're we're almost in the temple. Of, I expect to see Sankara stones, didn't you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the lighting and the bridges and the oh yeah, there's some good. Stuff I think there. Luthen still has those, so they didn't get them back. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I'm not sure they're on the timeline, but I think you're right. <laughs> I, I would I would say puzzlingly intriguing. I'm going to hyphenate it. Puzzlingly mm. intriguing. Uh, the puzzling part is at the end. We'll get to that. But I really, this one I thought was the most effective, consistent narrative tonally from beginning to end. The humor besides one moment felt organic, uh, and much more loosely or, or sparingly used, I guess, which I don't, I mean, I haven't minded the humor, but there are times where it might take you out of it for a moment. I don't feel like that happened here. I was really captivated by the trolls for a lot of interesting reasons. And uh, it was cool to see a familiar face. Um, mm-hmm. So not sure how, if he was used effectively, but, but we'll see. So where would you like to take this? Jen, let <laughs> go in um, reverse order of how we introduced uh, what kind of stands out to you or where do you want to kind of kick things off at? Um, ooh, where do we start? So you mentioned the trolls. I'll pick up on that. Cause that was one of sort of my, my most unexpected and uh, or most pleasant surprises. Um, 
you know, because I think based on the aesthetic, you know, I love a good troll mine. Uh, and based on the aesthetic, I was very much in a Lord of the Rings sort of mindset and expecting, you know, basically orcs, but, <laughs> but they're called <laughs> trolls. Uh, and then when we get um, these sort of like fussy bureaucratic, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, high, like intelligent, uh, articulate um, uh, trolls instead, I was, I was really taken aback and, and amused. Like it was, I found it to be very funny um, mm -hmm. and actually like a really nice subversion of sort of the, the trope. It really reminded me of HG Wells's time machine, the Morlocks uh, even mm -hmm. down to their, like the film adaptation from the sixties. I think they have this, the similar kind of hair, like the white kind of the silver white hair. Um, and and the the history or so the roots <laughs> of <laughs> of that kind of uh, character um, is pretty problematic because it was sort of like a, a perversion or racist perversion of of Darwin's natural selection. Um, and so the and, you know especially in H.G. Wells, like the the Morlocks are definitely supposed to be this sort of like primitive version of man that's you know inferior to the the hoi polloi that are you know up up above. And so. To me, it was really nice to sort of see an update of that trope and kind of a subversion of my expectations of that, uh, sort of breaking away from that history. So, and, and it, it reminded me too of um, of Beast from X Men, uh, in oh. terms of like, you know, <laughs> the, ar the, ar the articulate, uh, mellifluous nature of these hairy creatures. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I'll I'll just agree with that. I think you know one of the things this show has as a kind of uphill battle is the fact that so much fantasy has been created between mm -hmm. when the film happened and when this show happens. And I think when you enter into that space, you just have to engage with what's already come. Right? It reminds me about how Avengers Endgame had to explain how this was not Back to the Future time travel. It had to be, yes. you know, you have to grapple with it, even if you, you're differing from it. And so to everything Jen said, I thought this was a nice play on that. It's like, oh, we know you're expecting a snarling kind of grunting voice of some kind. So um, that probably for me was the biggest laugh of the episode. Um, that mm -hmm. that worked for me a lot when they um, and, and the fact, like you said, they were they were kind of fussy at all times, um, you know, felt felt a little C-3PO. There's a little shared DNA there. <laughs> And for some reason, these trolls have amazing abs. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're 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 constantly working out in the mine, right? It's true. Well, yeah. are, but are they? Are they making people do it for them? Okay. I guess it's all the walking. <laughs> right. There are many Perhaps. levels. It sounds like we know they have healthy bowel movements because of how Borman escaped. So that, that's no problem. <laughs> it's it's an interesting one because I did find it welcoming, and and it reminded me of remember that those old. Um, syndicated shows the hercules one and then the xena mm -hmm. princess. Yes. it kind of reminded remind me of a villain you might see in something like that mm. that's mm. a bit of a that's a bit of a a long distance rem memory there so i liked them i thought th i thought that they worked i i felt like that wasn't forced in any way and i found them refreshing and, and I, I i also welcome the fact that they were hyper intelligent and they had sort of a their own little delicacies and tendencies about them which i found refreshing but they also were very much happy to let their prisoners rot and suffer and be afraid so it's a very interesting paradox that you don't often expect and i guess in retrospect a show like this will probably do something like that because it does like to kind of walk that line but i found this to be one of the more effective things throughout the series so far but we also mentioned a new, we mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that there's a familiar face, Christian Slater. He is Allagash. Now, initially, he says that he is not Allagash, but he's in fact Man Mardigan. Uh, I'm assuming, I think we've talked about it before, I'm assuming people know why the real Man Mardigan has not appeared. Of course, in real life, um, Val Kilmer, if you saw Top Gun Maverick, then you've seen it. But you also, people also may very much be aware that he is. He's very sick. I believe he has throat cancer uh, and he's basically retired from acting. So he wouldn't have been able to do that. So before we talk about, about Christian Slater's character of Allagash, how do you think this series, uh, we could say this episode, how do you think this series would have been different if Matt Marigan was in it? Mm -hmm. 
it, it, I only recently, because I fell behind on podcasts, was listening to some beautiful pour over episodes where you were talking so much about Black Panther Wakanda Forever and how there was no way to do the film they wanted to. And so they found a way to make something new. And it, it just, it struck me as very much the same problem here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think for me, the moment in this episode um, was when uh, the character Willow, although it felt like Warwick saying, um, he said, for all the trouble he caused me, I really could have used him on this one. And it just mm. felt like a little shout out to, to Val Kilmer saying, you know, yeah. if, if we could have, we would have, we would have had you along and, and we really could have uh, enjoyed you being here. Um, so I, I definitely think it's not the choice you make if it's an option. I think you keep him in the mix because Val Kilmer is such a dynamic performer. Mm-hmm. And so that show then runs the risk of of some of the criticisms of the sequel trilogy where you have these really compelling characters and you want to introduce these new characters. How do you keep the the spotlight on them? So um, I think if anything, we just could have used a little bit of Mad Mardigan's uh, twinkle, right? Mm-hmm. The, the show is struggling to find that twinkle, that kind of ha ha, the I will be the, the strongest fighter while wearing a woman's dress uh, kind of uh, scene. So a little more of that, I think, uh, would have really helped the show along, um, despite many strengths of these younger performers. Sure. Well, very well said. Yeah, I, I think it was a really big challenge that they had to overcome. Uh, because Mad Mardigan and Val Kilmer playing Mad Mardigan specifically is arguably one of the best things about the original film. <laughs> <laughs> it's he's, it's peak Val Kilmer, yes. um, yeah. and, and so so Besides the idea top that <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the idea that that uh, yeah yeah Warwick Davis is coming back, um, Joanne Whaley I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly uh, is, are coming back, and you know it's Sorsha and her children, and then question like the question of like well then where is Mad Mardigan if we if we actually can't have Val Kilmer join us like how do we get around that how do we still make his presence felt uh without having him present uh and so I thought that was you know the way they hand have handled it so far and specifically in this episode I think to me seemed really well done um because they're trying to kind of like like Greg was saying they need the the sort of the sparkle that he had and like the very distinct element like personality and like kind of energy that he brought to the original film i think they've tried to displace that onto other characters with borman Mm -hmm. to a degree but then also this uh, allagash with christian slater and i think i think they're mostly there and i think they did the smart thing of we're not trying to give you a mad mardigan Mm 2.0 we're just trying to give you characters who are distinct characters unto themselves but who are providing that same energy, the sort of swashbuckling, kind of goofy, uh, you know, can you like roguish uh, sort of characters, but they're not, it's very clear that they're not there to replace Mad Mardigan. Um, the yeah. other, the other fun behind the scenes fact that I read up on is that it's actually um, Val Kilmer and Joanne Whaley's son. Who's the voice in the tomb. Um, oh. uh, Jack Kilmer, I believe is his name. Um, so I, yes. so it's, it's clear that they've been very thoughtful about how to do this. David W. Collins, Lucasfilm's, uh, sound maestro extraordinaire so that they, mm-hmm. they used, um, his voice. And I think they used, they've spliced in some Val Kilmer too, and modulated it. And it sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. It, it's a very loving homage. And I agree. I think the, the man Mardigan principle is sort of like trying to do the prequel trilogy without Harrison Ford. You just can't replace that archetype. And there really isn't anything even close to that in the prequel trilogy. But in this, you've got your Bormans, you've got the snarkiness of some of the other characters. But I feel like Mad Mardigan in this story would have maybe overshadowed things a little bit. Mm. And as much as I miss him, I, I liked how this ensemble cast has sort of taken on this mantle and sort of done something unique with it. It does make for a different audience, perhaps, but but I think it works to that degree. So, But let's talk about the character that is here. Allagash played again by Christian Slater, who's I've always liked Christian Slater. He's he's like a lot of uh, some iconic actors in Hollywood. They're pretty much playing themselves, but they play themselves so well that we just don't care. And I feel like that's <laughs> his way. So Allagash at first says that he's Man Mardigan for a really long time, and then we get into some some 
some muddy storytelling, I think. And maybe that's by design. I'm not quite sure about that. And I don't mean that to be as a pejorative, but I do mean, so it's unclear why Allagash and Borman don't like each other. They both say, both basically say, no, it's actually, you're the traitor. You're the turtling, mm-hmm. not me. And it's never, ever clear. And it appears that Allagash is dead unless he has some sort of heroic resurgence, which of course would not be un- unlikely to happen in the mythology. So I guess I'm not sure. I mean, I, I really enjoyed him. I liked him being a foil for Borman because there really isn't a um, physical equal to Borman in this series so far. I like that part of it. And maybe there's some ambiguity there, but part of me still feels like, I feel like I'm missing a page or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. I think I had to, inf- I felt like I was inferring a lot, but where I ultimately landed was that Borman is relative to Ag- Allagash telling the truth. And, and because the way they set the up, opposite, really, I think okay, I landed so, on the opposite yeah. too. Oh yeah. no. So, <laughs> so yeah. Cause, cause to me it seemed, well, maybe it's just cause I like Borman better as a character uh, mm. and, and he's been around longer. Um, but I, to me, it felt like because they set up, it's sort of like, you know, Greg said twisty at the top of, uh, of the conversation. I think the, the teasing of he's hiding something, I think it's a twist that it's like, oh, actually, the biggest mistake of his life was leaving Mad Mardigan behind as opposed to trying to steal the um, cuirass. So that's how I interpreted it. And that was the, like a half a line, I feel like, towards the end of the episode <laughs> where, I, where he says, like, the biggest mistake of my life or something like that. That that was sort of where what what I gravitated towards to kind of interpret what the truth was. But I do think that it is very ambiguous. And to me, like, you know, Dan, you mentioned muddy storytelling. I feel like they really were trying to lean into the unreliable narrator, you know, Mm -hmm. as we, as they sort of set up last week um, with like, you know, what they're showing us is different from what Borman's telling Mm. (laughs) Scorpio. Right. So to me, I think they just kind of, it just sort of like got away from them. They were like, Oh, like, wouldn't it be fun to have these roguish characters who are like, you don't know when, when they're telling the truth and when they're lying, but they kind of lost sight of the fact that we as viewers still need concrete truth to hold on to of like, wait, so, so what, where are we in relation to these characters? Um, so yeah, I think I, I totally hear, hear your uh, response to that. Yeah. Unreliable narratives is a great catch because we still need an anchor. We still need an anchor. Greg, what do you think? Well, I was just, uh, as I am want to do thinking of last Jedi and how, you know, you get Luke's version and Kylo's version, and then you get the kind of middle version or, you know, so you kind of see, uh, the truth and, and you're right. We missed that one. And I'll just add, I think you're, you're both right that it was purposefully muddy and meant to kind of confuse you a little and, and who to trust. But for me, the, the kind of notch too far is to also throw in these kind of MacGuffin objects into the mix, which I don't entirely understand. And then we get them both and we reunite them and then they don't work for at least, you know, uh, Allagash. Um, so I think those two components being mixed together was a, was a bit too much for me. And I definitely uh, couldn't tell exactly what was going on. Um, I, I'm not even sure if this spreads throughout the country, but I will say up here in the Northeast, uh, Allagash is a brewery that makes delicious beer. So that was all mm. I was really thinking about every time his name came up. <laughs> right on. We're going to have to take me to that one day. <laughs> is the Allagash white? Yes, the white ale the is the, okay. the popular yeah, yeah. one. I remember yes, that absolutely. One, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So well, I, do we? Yeah. Go ahead. Do we even think that the what they think is the cuirass is real? That was sort of my thing too, where I was like, I don't even know. I sure hope not, because that mm-hmm. was very. Because it looks so. It looks very flimsy. Yeah, I, I don't think that's it. But but I am apt to, or I'm inclined to agree with you on this, Greg. Why at this point? Why do I care? Besides a, a fun little story, I think in the second or third episode. I'm still not sure what benefit it has because, but who, who's, what's our, what's our chosen, you know, MacGuffin here? Is it, is it the fact when, when Elora is going to discover her powers and fully just own the mantle, or is it going to be some armor that protects one guy? You know what I mean? I mean, you can, this is not a mutually exclusive concept, but again, I feel like that's part of the trick of this, of this, um, 
trickly narrative that I sometimes have a hard time really biting my teeth into. And I really want to, I really want, I really want this to be the scrumptious <laughs> sirloin that I can just sink my teeth into. And maybe I'm expecting too much. I don't know. I don't think so. I kept coming back to, so um, I was very far behind on this show and after your invitation caught up and as I was watching, I kept coming back to that. It was really well made to your point that, mm -hmm. that you want there to be really good substance there because clearly the, the costumes and the, the creature effects and all the familiar names yes. in the production are so well done. And, and it means that, you know, it should be on par with some of the big fantasy shows on other streaming services. And there's something holding it back. And, and I think it's a little of this muddiness. Um, and to your, your uh, use of kind of this trickling out of details in which direction it, it is, it's very much like a stream and it, and it hits a rock and it branches. And I'm never entirely sure which branch I really want to follow or who's going to be the, the, the main thrust of the story. And that's something the film actually did pretty well. It set up some clear goals and it, it was a kind of traditional quest movie and, and kind of went through with it. So it is, I think they're struggling despite again, just, you know, good acting and, and fun characters and, and production design. So I like the stream metaphor because I, I, I think that might be a good way to describe it. I, I feel a little thirsty after. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like I've been quenched, but I just don't feel, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I don't really have anything to compare it to because I know this is very much a separate thing. I still enjoy the series. I'm still recommending the series, but I just feel like there's something missing. And maybe, maybe it's all encompassed or is it comes around the character of Willow himself. I still, mm -hmm. I'm six episodes in, if there are eight left, I still don't know what to make of Willow. He's a titular character, but I think you could argue it, sh it shouldn't be called Willow. Like Willow and his amazing friends, I don't know what you call it, mm -hmm. but that would be very Spidey-ish, wouldn't it? But <laughs> I, I don't know. Like where, where, it where it throws for me is that just when I start to like him and really like feel like a, uh, a, a, a connection with him then Alora and willow reunite and i forget who initiates it but one of them says i miss you and i was like well i i kind of miss you too now, so i think it was willow says i kind of miss you too okay so if willow like this is a romantic tension if mm -hmm. if willow is like this reluctant mentor which i do again like that angle the reluctant mentor concept why is this yet to be reluctant about owning the fact that he misses this person who he has a magical and spiritual connection with? I, mm. That didn't work for me at all. That's the one part of this whole episode that really took me out of it completely. I scratched my head thinking, why? What, what, are, we, what, is, what are we gaining here? Mm. I just feel like he, he probably just hasn't had his moment yet, right? Because we got, we got the, the truth at, from the previous episode, episode five where he confides in Graydon about how he feels like a hack. And mm -hmm. like he's, he, you know, everyone assumes he's this great sorcerer and really he just was lucky in the original film. And I feel like the logical step, step from that is for him to tell that to Elora so that, that she can, cause she's also going through this imposter syndrome of like, you know, mm -hmm. everyone is, acting like I'm the most important thing in the whole world. And I don't feel like it. Like, I don't feel like I'm, I should be the one who's saving everybody else. And so I feel like they need, just need to sync up or at least this is what I want. <laughs> they need to sync up so that they can better understand each other. Because I think, um, you know, for me, at least oftentimes as a teacher with my own students, I feel like when I'm meeting them where they are and sort of telling them, like I was once, I either am currently or was once where you are right now. And I understand what you, how you feel about this. That's sort of what unlocks a teaching moment oftentimes. And so to me, I feel like that's what I'm waiting for. I hope we get that in the last two episodes. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, like I was looking through my notes just now. I didn't take a single note about Willow from this episode. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I, you're both describing when I talk about pedagogy, it's it's about empathy and understanding who these these students are, and and that's what's lacking here. Is um, I I think to Willow that is still a baby, 
right? Uh, the baby he rescued and and all those years ago, um, and and more like a, a symbol as well, right? That it's it's the save the salvation of the world, but it's not actually a, a human person that he's engaged with. So maybe that's why he can't even miss her because he's he's a thing, um, or she's a thing to him, um, right? And and maybe to that I'll just tack on. I think my struggle with Willow is um, the character that is 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 I think. I think I know Warwick Davis too much. Um, and so mm-hmm. I see him and I think of, um, you know, his fantastic life's too short show where yes. he has, you know, some real humor. And um, I, I read his autobiography a, a good number of years ago. Um, and I just, I know all the kind of quirks and humor he has. And so when, you know, I, I believe in this episode, Willow says, where's the Lou? that just felt to me like that's a Warwick joke. That's not the character of Willow. Like Warwick probably came up on that in the moment. So, um, so all of that I think is, is working against him. And and I, I feel like it's unfair criticism because it's, it's my baggage, not, not anything he's bringing to the performance, but, but it's, it's tricky for me. It is. And and I still am, you know, pedagogically, I remember uh, Ron Clark is a great uh, pioneering educator uh, for elementary uh, students and I, and I heard him speak once, and he said, "I don't have to like all of my students, but I do have to care about them." Mm. I really like that a lot for a, for a lot of wonderful reasons. But w- w- regardless of how you feel about your students, I just thought it was awkward. It was just awkward dialogue, like episode two level awkward dialogue, and that, that was unfortunate uh, because I, I think I think the role and the actor is is better than that. So we'll move on from that. Uh, the the Willow angle itself uh, and the magic. Uh, where are we on Allura and what what is her um, like? I believe it was Anthony King a few weeks ago who said we're still not sure how the magic works in Willow, mm-hmm. and that's absolutely spot on. I I'm still trying to figure out, and I and I'm enjoying seeing uh, her lack of understanding of her place in this universe. I almost said galaxy or place in this universe, uh, her identity crisis and all the, imagine all these expectations and pressure on you to be the ultimate savior. And you're just, and the imposter syndrome, it seems authentic here. I, I think I'm trying let me look up the actor's name. It is, is it Ellie Bamber? That's yes. Right. Yes. Yes. She's, I think she's terrific in this show. Mm-hmm. She's she's very effective. She says a lot with her expressions, but I, I'm in, I'm enjoying seeing it. But but then there are times when, and I don't want to be the wet blanket of the episode, but <laughs> when like I wish I could see a little bit more. And I lo- again, I love ambiguity. I like the intellectual side of this, obviously, but I I want to see some bridges to. Uh, I don't get it, and sometimes I get it so well, and and sometimes I can't even pronounce these these words that are somewhat Latin slash gibberish, and then other times, I, I'm I'm just like a sage. So I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? I think I agree that it's not entirely clear or like if you asked me to explain exactly how the magic works of the show, I don't know if I could do it. Couldn't. Um, that said, I feel like they're doing a lot with Alora in this episode in terms of showing how, you know, as she says, I feel like every time I try to control the magic, it feels like it's slipping away. And so it's sort of this thing that's beyond her control, but is growing in power, I think. And so because the for me, it was she and it was like a very subtle moment. I almost missed it. But there were two times in the episode where she kind of like looks down into mm-hmm. the minds and then you hear what I what I realized after kind of like rewinding it <laughs> was, <laughs> was Kit's voice uh, and then I put the captions on because I was like well what is she saying and if she's prophesizing the end of the episode or mm. she's uh, uh, it's a it's a vision that she's having or kind of like she's predicting what's happening at the end of the episode because it's the line that Kit says of like why I really need to know why he always chose you instead of me Mm. It's that kind of like really, which is a beautiful moment. It's like very emotionally climactic yes. um, for those two characters. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I like that, but I was like, if I hadn't gone through the trouble of like rewinding and turning on the captions, I would have totally missed that. Uh, and they had also in the previous episode talked about how 
Um, there's sort of a checklist of the, she's like, well, I just need to do divination and like telekinesis <laughs> is that I'm good. Right. Like, and so I feel like that's what they're doing is that they're slowly working through that list of mm. abilities. And then at the end, I guess like she'll be complete, but, um, but yeah, but beyond that, and there's also a thing going on with when she says, when she's really close to the crone, right. She gets this panicky feeling, or it seems like her magic is activating more. Mm -hmm. um around her mm -hmm. right because they, they show the the elixir starts bubbling more um and things start shaking and and so yeah but it's but it's again it's not clear sort of what what is happening and maybe that's a surprise and that's the point is like well there'll be an explanation of it later i, ho I hope so i hope so <laughs> yeah and, and you know i think we're mixing in a lot of kit discussion naturally here because mm -hmm. of, of that end of that episode. And, um, you know, as I think through my mythology studies and so on, and, and, you know, kit here is at the bottom of the hero's journey, right? She finally has to really experience the loss of her father. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's gone for good. He's, he's outside of, of her reach. And, you know, that's usually the moment when the hero meets with the great truth that they'll bring back to society. And the fact that she's left with protect Alora and that that's so personally devastating to her is, is really, really compelling. And probably my favorite moment in this episode as, as we were uh, unpacking it. Um, but it's hard not to feel that Alora is just kind of stuck in the middle of that story instead of really experiencing something on her own. And to tie that back to the moment Dan talked about, then we have now, and, and I would put uh, her earlier conversation with uh, Graydon into this mix, is she has a lot of people who are compelled to connect with her mm -hmm. and yet seem unable to connect with her. Um, and so much of her kind of backstory is, is kind of foggy still, like the, the year she spent in, in hiding as the muffin maid. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I, I don't necessarily expect more revelations, but I think there's something there about maybe they intended her to be very sheltered. And so she's unable to make these connections. Mm. And, and maybe that, that just limits your ability to do magic. Who knows? I that's, don't know the rules either. <laughs> well, no, yeah, that's interesting. I like that. No, I think the kit moment, her her sort of um, uh, um, reluctant epiphany is really beautiful. I, mm -hmm. it is, that is my, that, I think that is the best emotional beat in this entire series. Mm -hmm. It's really extraordinarily done. It's well acted. Uh, the execution of it is brilliant. And you suddenly realize, okay, this, this is beyond just some sort of shallow, silly, teen drama this is like why did my father pick you over me we don't know how much time she got to spend with her father how much her real memories are of her father besides the fact that he is her father and you know this mythological knight hero person i to me that was that was why this episode is stood out to me so well besides the humor of the trolls it's interesting to try to figure out besides the the concept of a reluctant mentor We've got a reluctant hero who very much stays in the early parts of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey for a, for a really long time. Uh, and maybe that's part of the challenge too of the series is we've got so many characters in such a small amount of time to get to know them because eight episodes is not a lot of time. It's a very, very small amount of time. So I hope we get to see more of that because I've always liked Kit, but this episode made me love her mm. because of how it was done. See, for me, it was... I was annoyed by her <laughs> initially. I did not mm. like her. She was probably at the bottom of my list in terms sure. of characters that I personally connected with. Cause it, to me, she felt sort of like whiny and entitled. And, and then yeah. this episode made me realize, ah, oh, like, okay, she, she is on this, the, she and Alora are two sides of this, this prophecy coin mm -hmm. where they're both feeling the burden of it in different ways. Right. That, she she is grappling with trying to understand why why everyone acts like Alora is the key to everything. She doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. <laughs> so like, mm. what is going on? Right. And then and whereas everybody, all the other characters around her, so very blindly buy into it, right? Uh, it's a foregone conclusion, and she's actually taking the time to question, like, well, why is it that we're like, what well, you know, why mm. why are you the most important thing that matters? Um, and whereas Alora feels like the pressure of having to be this chosen one figure right of where she's she 
she's like, especially since she spent her whole life not thinking that she was a Laura Tannen, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? And so she's really struggling with the everyone's looking to me, but I can't. I'm not. I'm not the one they should be looking for. I'm going to disappoint everybody. So, to, yeah, to me that really felt like the, the, that. This is this is the heart of the show that the two of them, and I never would have guessed that. I think I would have sort of dismissed right. Kit as, as a more secondary character. Sure. Mm -hmm. And understandably so. And I think that's what makes this cliffhanger so great because you're still like, all right, I'm emotionally invested. Oh, geez. Now what are we going to do? Uh, so Greg, you haven't gotten a chance to bring up a topic uh, yet. So are there any things in your notes that are jumping out that we haven't discussed yet that you'd like to talk about? Um. We hit on most of what I said in my list. Um, I do have, uh, I, I had a lot of fun playing the find the Lucasfilm comparison because uh, as Jen it. pointed, there's there's some Temple of Doom and a, a, lost cru a last crusade moment uh, with the, the shifting camera angle uh, yeah. and so on. Yes. Um, and I also thought parts of the, the mind sneaking had just a little bit of a new hope Death Star vibe to them, hmm, kind of yeah. on the edge of these chasms, and and no bad guys through. around when they don't need to be there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess the piece that I'll I'll raise is um, we begin and end with Eric, um, and uh, the Lucasfilm DNA I saw there was the Clone Wars episode. Um, is it called Into the Void? I want to say yes. the Sunny Sunny the, Day in the Void. Sunny Day in the Void. One yes, of my favorite where, episodes. <laughs> he he marches off and and returns to the city, um, and I think I the way I'd phrase this is in all that we just discussed, we kind of forget him as a MacGuffin, and whereas Kit is kind of dealing with uh, across the last couple episodes, um, the fact that she's the the granddaughter of the evil sorceress and the daughter of of Matt Mardigan, um, you would think. Eric would be experiencing all of that and, and yet seems very separate. So I don't know. I, I feel like I'm on uh, the other show I do where I'm asking a question instead of giving a statement, but how do you think Eric fits into all this? Cause that's the piece I'm struggling with. This is Vanessa Marshall and you're listening to coffee with Kenobi. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this, actually. Uh, well, one thing I do like about this show is that it's it's really it's the inclusivity is really nice. I think it's cool that we've got instead of a the you know the the ancient concept of a of a damsel in distress and the princess rescue. We've got it. It's the other way around. Hmm. I love that. I love the gender reversal, uh, and that is becoming more of the norm. Thankfully. Uh, he is interesting because he's not interesting at all. The first episode, he was fascinating. Uh, and I liked that there was more to the shallow, handsome fellow than that, than we were originally led to believe. Um, but we see at the end of this episode that he is, no, Dan, he actually is that shallow. <laughs> he actually is. Uh, we've been talking about the music a lot. And, oh, jeez. I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this. That was brutal it was brutal <laughs> at the end uh i don't remember the music is it is it good vibrations at the very yep, end the beach oh, boys jeez even worse. <laughs> brian wilson if he was dead would be rolling in his grave <laughs> um yeah because he goes through this massive he basically he's goes through a journey in the episode and he's crawling through this dirt and um it's sort of confusing to see where he is and which way is up it's kind of remind if you're reading have you read the new Stephen King book, Fairy Tale? Have you read that? I haven't. I could not recommend it more highly. Mm. It's fabulous. But there's a great sequence in the middle where uh, the main character is lost, and it's impossible to know where he is by looking at the horizon. It kind of reminds me of that. And then at the end, he sees this woman who at first I thought was Kit with a wig, a really bad wig. Mm. And then I realized, no, that's not. It's just when it looks sort of like her. And then he looks at her, and, and it appears, based on the Brian Wilson tune, uh, that he's falling in love at the end. And I just thought, I'm sorry, but how groin-centric is this guy? 
I just I just found it really shallow and cheap. I mean, uh, you gave him the benefit beat. of the doubt, and he disappointed you. Very yeah. much so. I just I just think, okay, what in the world? Why am I spending my time with this guy? Uh, he's in love with Alora, who he calls Dove. But then, after being stranded and having this sort of realization that. Oh, I got to grow up. Uh, something is clearly wrong here with the, where's my sister? Where's my family? Oh, she's pretty. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, I don't know. It just drove me nuts. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, I, I mean, I totally agree with everything you just said for me, the, where I kind of deflected my mind to when I was kind of like being disappointed like you was this feels like, the sort of fairy tale trap of like this is like she's actually the crone yes. um and yes. trying to trick him right like that that's kind of where my mind went in a way that made it okay for me <laughs> um <laughs> but because i'm like you know this is we only have two episodes left who is this person <laughs> like right. uh and and that then made me retroactively wonder is mad martigan's voice in the tomb actually mad martigan at all or or is that also mm -hmm. the crone trying to lure it because I, I sort of saw a symmetry between kit sort of because she she walks towards the light in a very sort of like like she, almost like she's entranced um mm -hmm. and and obviously she has an emotional reason to be doing that but but that seemed to me i read that as kind of a little bit more like she's not even in control of what she's doing she's just kind of being drawn in like a siren song mm -hmm. uh so to me i kind of saw that as a parallel that since they are both and and then that would make the line about the blood of Bav Morta runs through your veins like that would make that useful mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. from a storytelling perspective because then it's like oh, okay they're the two who are going to be tempted and they will have to resist um the crone's influence i you're probably right i hope you are <laughs> It makes me, I, again, back to the rules of what is magic. I keep forgetting that we're also dealing with multiple dimensions here. So is, really? is Mad Mardigan somewhere in a different dimension? And is Eric in that same dimension? Or is he actually in reality? Um, the, the sequence, you know, uh, other than that Clone Wars episode, it, it reminded me, too, of um, uh, the final Harry Potter book, uh, uh, Harry goes and sees Dumbledore one last time in, in this kind of ethereal plane and Dumbledore's great line, like, um, you know, just because it happened in your head doesn't mean it's not real. And it, it felt like we could be doing something there as well. Is he actually in, you know, a, a torture rack somewhere and, and these are his experiences mm -hmm. and his, his psyche is, is tempting him with, with <laughs> some good vibrations uh, or uh, is this, you know, uh, literal. But, I, you know, when Jen was talking, I like this idea that maybe it turns out the last two episodes are about defeating Eric, who's fallen to the dark side or, or given into the crone in some ways. Um, it's a little hard because uh, Graydon was already pulled back from a possession. It feels like we wouldn't necessarily get that exact same beat again. So, um, But that was his second else, time. I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Well, if it is a torture rack, I feel like I am living vicariously having to go through that <laughs> that sequence. Uh, um, let, let's talk about Graydon. He is, um, since he's uh, a lovesick puppy dog, he's a little less interesting and a little less um, mature. But I think he's been so, um, you know, you know, square peg round hole situation pushed into this this mantra of of royalty when he really just wants to be a, a kid or be an adolescent and fall in love. And Allura uh, apparently is leaning that direction or at least she was for one episode. And I don't know. I, I, again, I keep, I keep thinking, here's the thing. Look, and people have been listening to the show for, for a while, whether it's been a while or a little bit. No, I like a good story. I like a good story. Well told. I like ambiguity. I like having to think. I like not having all the answers. But I also want consistency in my characters. That's why I struggled and still struggle with the rise of Skywalker mm -hmm. for the Poe character, for some of the other things that happened in that show. And why I think The Last Jedi is perfection. Because it takes what we know about these characters and gives it layers and complexity and a realism. And I'm just not finding that. And again, maybe maybe I just need to come to grips with the fact that maybe I'm not this specific audience. Maybe 
uh, a crusty English teacher is in the <laughs> audience for Willow. Maybe that's possible. Um, so you're recreating a, a conversation I have a lot with my co-host on my Wheel of Time podcast. And what he would say were he here is, remember that teenagers aren't consistent. And I think, you know, we demand something of those characters in stories because that's how stories function and how we relate to them and, and draw ourselves in. But in reality, yeah, he could be, you know, not sure of himself and then a lovesick puppy and then Certainly. then uh, all over the map. Now, I'm, I'm just describing that to my co-host. I, I'm with you. I want I want this guy, <laughs> especially because I have such deep affection for that actor, uh, Tony Revolori from from Flash Funny. and from mm -hmm. uh, especially The Lobby Boy and Grand Budapest Hotel, one of my yes. favorite movies. Um, so I really want more from him. Um, but I, the, the only other thought I had is, is it is again, what you were talking about, about Eric being the, the damsel in distress, the, the gentleman in distress, it is an inversion of another type that oftentimes the female character has a betrothal and is actually mm -hmm. in love with somebody else and doesn't get developed as who she would be. So now we're just going to leave Tony here as a, as a bit of a blank, um, uh, or sorry, Graydon, uh, not the actor. Um, mm. So maybe it is just another version of that in inversion. I like a version of that inversion. Well, I like that. <laughs> I like that. I don't know. Well, what, what, what other stones have we not uncovered yet um, as we get closer to revealing our grades, which mine is fluctuating all the time. I've erased and repenciled in my rubric several times throughout <laughs> this episode. I only have a, a shout out to the riddles. I thought the riddles were really fun. Yes. Um, yeah, I have some questions good. about that whole sequence, but but the actual, mm -hmm. you know, whenever <sighs> there's there's a riddle in a story, if I can't get it immediately, I'm like, all right, you've got me. You're pretty clever. So <laughs> hard not to think of Gollum in in Bilbo, mm. right? Which is perfection. Mm. True. Right. True. I, I liked that they got it right away for the first one, but then it took a super long time to figure out the second mm. one. I felt like to me that was sort of commenting on, on how in these adventure stories, oftentimes the riddles are too quickly like that, you know, they just breeze through them mm. in a lot of ways. Um, and so I thought that that was, I liked that. And then, and they had a chance to kind of pace and stew. Did, uh, did, did the verisimilitude of that, of that sequence bother either of you that the second riddle and then clearly this is not uh, the Sphinx from Oedipus Rex, right? Mm -hmm. Did it bother you that they had so long and it was just like a repeating message over and over again? It, 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 there was no sense of danger or panic once I realized this is just going to keep going and going. And there, even the characters are like, don't even seem to be all that concerned with mm -hmm. it. That, yeah. that, that was a, I think that was a bit of a missed opportunity. Hmm. Yeah, have the right. ceiling coming down like like in something. Temple of Doom or something. Yes. Yeah, Make, give it, give us, give me cost, right? Give me, <laughs> give me a reason to be concerned because then it amps the emotion. Imagine if there was, and then Kit survives that, and then she falls into that lava pool. Imagine mm. how much more emotional that would have been. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To me, the the tomb actually almost had kind of a carnival feeling to it, where the vo especially the voice of, and I'm forgetting his name now. Um, of the, of the Ellen Wiggleheim. Um, Wiggleheim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's going to make you say it, not me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, to, to me, like it, the, just the, the movement and the voice made me feel like the, there was sort of a sham element to it almost of like, Wizard of Oz. it's yeah. all, of us. it was like, yeah, mm, exactly. Wizard yeah. of Oz. Um, and then that made me wonder the, the room that they start frant that, that Borman and Allagash start frantically, uh, rifling through to me that seemed like a decoy mm. uh yeah same especially with the, the cuirass they... seemed to be just piece of brass or something right yeah. right um and so but again they didn't really give us enough to draw any actual substantial conclusions from that i feel like mm. so unless we revisit here i don't know <laughs> to make of it um but that's sort of that's sort of why i thought this the the actual like life and death stakes were didn't seem as high. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because uh, there was a nice little meta textual joke. Um, I think it was the last episode, the the 
fourth, no, the fifth, um, where somebody says, we're tired of your side quests, right? Like they're, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, we're going to pr- know what the audience is posting online before, before this even airs. And um, because all of that amounted to so little, it just feels like this was a distraction before going on to something bigger and better. Cause, cause like you said, yeah, it did feel like a decoy and, and, or it had already been ransacked and, and some such, but there's no way we're going back there. There's no way there's some added revelation to that. So it just seems, uh, you know, like, okay, that, now let's go to the real story. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, let, let's do this and let, let's go ahead and give our letter grades and, and try to sort of I- explain and ration them out. Uh, who would like to go first? I'll go first. So okay. <laughs> I actually came into this thinking I was going to give it an A because uh, I've been fairly up and down and sort of mixed on the season so far. But to me, this felt like the strong, clearly the strongest episode, just in terms of the contained story within it. Um but now that we've picked it apart, <laughs> I feel like I've talked. Now, Sorry. now I feel like I want to go down. Um, it, it it sort of feels like when you read the student paper really quickly, and you're like, "Oh, that was pretty good," and then you go back to read it more carefully later, and you're like, "Oh, wait, I'm noticing all these things now." <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So, so to me, I probably would need to go down to an A minus because I feel like relative to the other episodes we've gotten, this one was very strong. I felt like it had. It had very clear emotion. While even though the storytelling is muddy in terms of the logistics and sort of like who, what's happening and what, what does this all mean and where the lore and all that sort of stuff, to me, the emotional beats were so very clear and the stake, emotional stakes were so very high um, for, for, for all the characters, but primarily for Allura and Kit and Borman, too, which we didn't really talk about, that he, he seems to be going through this big struggle where like, you know, he was sort of hiding behind his swashbuckliness for most of the season and his sarcasm. And then the la- la- these last two episodes, episodes five and six, seemed to really be kind of making him more vulnerable um, mm. in a way that I liked. So to me, I still have to go A minus um, for, for all those reasons. I can, I can ignore all the other stuff that we've been nitpicking. <laughs> all right. So, Greg? Uh Filling in my rubric, uh, I will say I'm I'm really trying hard to grade this as an episode of the show it is and not some other show or the show I imagined Willow could be, uh, because that is always how I approach such tasks. Uh, you know, uh, it's not it's not the assignment I gave. It's what they were able to make of it. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a B plus for me. And I'm going to say that, uh, you know, a lot of things were working so much better here than in previous episodes. And and I think Dan alluded to the, the humor was working a little better. Jen, just referring to all those great emotional moments. I think it was a B for me. But then that great moment with with Kit, she earned the extra half uh, letter grade for the group project and, and bumped it up to a B plus for me. Um, and and yet I'm, you know, like like a uh, a real college professor. When I give a B plus, I know I'll be hearing from that student to talk about how it's not an A minus. So I know that my my decision is not final on this. And after we see where these last couple episodes go, it, I may revisit this and and curve it a little. <laughs> Which that is that is actually a great transition to why I struggle with the Hunger Games series. Because I feel like if I have to wait for the rest of it to ma- to care about the individual parts, that's problematic for me. <laughs> for me, but it, but it's it's pretty pretty apt to the idea of I got to grade this on on a scale of what the show is and what it's told me that it is, uh, not what I want it to be or not how I would do it. <laughs> and overall, I'm pretty good about that. Uh, and I uh, this one is more of a challenge for me. I was going to give it a B plus. Uh, generous B plus, but after hearing uh, some of our commentary and being reminded of good vibrations, it's a it's a very very generous B minus, a very mm. generous B minus, because I will grade it on what it, I've been given. What I've been given is inconsistent uh, in tone, uh, structurally. I don't know if it's inconsistent structurally because it's been incons- consistently inconsistent. 
<laughs> and that's struggle. I struggle with that as a as a person who loves story and storytelling and breaking them down and and really pouring into them and what works and what doesn't. More often than not, it works. I love these characters a lot, and I feel like instead of spending the money on the royalties for these songs, maybe uh, give the script another pass. <laughs> you know, maybe fill in a few more of these gaps without dumbing it down for us. I definitely don't want to be dumbed down. I want to be thought of as an, an intelligent viewer, but I also think that I, I I shouldn't have to be like, well, okay, I'll give that a pass. I feel like I said that multiple times every week. And mm. I it's because I love Lucasfilm and fantasy and storytelling so much that that I that I find myself, I won't say struggling, but kind of coasting instead of savoring. Mm. So there we there we have it. There we have well there are yeah, there are two good. left. There are two <laughs> left. Maybe we'll maybe that will change. And who knows? I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm certainly not gonna miss it. And I would strongly encourage you listening here on the show to make sure not to miss the awesome exploits of both Greg and Jen. Thank <laughs> you both as always for joining me on Coffee with Kenobi. Always a pleasure and a delight to have you both on and to learn from the two of you. Greg, where can people find you and all of your great work? Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and, and really making sure I kept up with Willow because you're right. Uh, all my criticism aside, it's worth seeing. You know, it's mm -hmm. new Lucasfilm and, and what have they given us but great adventures our whole lives. So, yes. uh, boy, the best place to find me is after you get up tomorrow morning and decide whether you're doing Willow or Bad Batch first. If you choose Bad Batch, uh, you can find me over on uh, Greg McLaughlin's uh, Rebel Base Card podcast. We're doing our Bad Batch recaps starting up this weekend. So uh, that's that's a great place to find me. And then I'm at Ion Cannon on Instagram and Hive. Are we still on Hive? I think we're still on Hive. We'll so. see. I'm there. Uh, at it's hanging EYE. on by a thread. Yeah, it lost a chunk, but the, it's it's there. So E-Y-E-O-N-C-A-N-O-N. -E and Jen, what about you? Sure. Um, so you can find find my writing at thelongtake.substack.com. Uh, it's a hybrid blog and newsletter, and I review lots of things, uh, but cons very consistently every new Marvel or Star Wars um, show or film. So I am, I am, you know, I've had an adequate rest over the holiday season. I'm ready to cover Bad Batch. I'm really excited. Um, and it's also Oscar season's heating up, so I'm going to try to squeeze in some reviews uh, for that, especially as we get closer. I'm, I'm a big uh, Oscar pool prediction nerd, and so I'll be doing, you know, helping you with your own Oscar pool uh, there if you'd like. <laughs> um, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at Subchakshai, S-O-P-C-H-O-C-K-C-H-A-I. Uh, and you can find me on Hive at Qui-Gon Jen. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along.